There you go, there are a few more people. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming. I know it's late in the day and everybody's got to go back and get ready for the party and get all their party gear on and all that kind of stuff. But thank you so much for coming. My name is Matt McSpirit and I'm a senior product marketing manager at Microsoft based in the US, uh, but originally from England. So we don't talk about football now at all anymore. Um, as if we ever did. Uh, and this session is, is really aimed at helping you understand just what choice is out there from a virtualization perspective. It's part one of a two-part series aiming to help you go back to your organizations with a more rounded view of choices that you can make around virtualization and subsequently private cloud technologies. So part two is tomorrow morning, uh, which is great, after the party, half past eight, I think it is. Um, but this session is really focused on hypervisor choices and some of the key features and capabilities and scale numbers across three key hypervisor platforms. But tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning, as I said, that's great. There we go, private cloud. And that's tomorrow morning at half eight. Although that says that that's the TechEd Orlando slide, so it's tomorrow morning in the morning, trust me. So, choices. Let's get some interactive content going here. How many people are running either VMware vSphere or the vSphere hypervisor, ESXi? Okay. Note, note to the video, just two people put their hands up. Um, so yeah, quite a few. And, and you know what? I expect that because VMware, they're a market leader. They've got some great technology still, and they have had for a long time. They do some cool stuff, some really cool features, and some of them we'll explore today and talk about. So from a VMware perspective, we're going to talk about vSphere and the hypervisor. Some people choose to just run ESXi, as, as many of us know it, without the surrounding vSphere management technologies. But obviously, you're limited in some of the things you can do there. So a lot of organizations go up to vSphere. But out of interest, how many people are running Citrix, Zen Server? OK, a few, a few. And finally, brrr, how many people are running Hyper-V? 100%, 100% of the room. No, thank you, thank you. So Hyper-V, it's, it's interesting with Hyper-V. We're starting to really see some increased adoption with, with Hyper-V. Since 2008 R2 and going forward to 2012, we're seeing a lot of enthusiasm and awareness is growing about just what's in Hyper-V. It's currently in the leaders quadrant within the magic quadrant from uh, Gartner, both for 2011 and 2012. So that's good recognition in the industry that Hyper-V is ticking the boxes that organizations are typically looking for. But it's important to note that the most recent magic quadrant was based on 2008 R2 Hyper-V not the stuff that's coming in 2012. So next year's Magic Quadrant is going to be even more interesting. But a lot of organizations think that the only way I can get Hyper-V is as part of Windows Server. So I'm going to have to buy Windows Server, and then I can tick the box, and I can enable Hyper-V. But actually, that's one way of getting hold of it. But the other is something called Hyper-V Server, which is, in some ways, it's almost Microsoft's best-kept secret. It's this free hypervisor, completely free to download for everybody, and it's got all of the same Hyper-V capabilities that exist within Windows Server Hyper-V. You think, that, that sounds a bit too good to be true. You know, Microsoft are just giving away all of the cool functionality in 2012 Hyper-V, and they're giving it away in this free hypervisor. So we'll explore some of the use cases for that and why you would use it uh, very shortly. But it is a free download. It just contains the Hyper-V bit, which is really, really thin, very, very thin, the Hyper-V element itself. The core Windows Server driver model and the key components it needs, like clustering, for example. So you can still do all of the cool stuff we'll talk about later in Hyper-V. It's a smaller footprint. So this version of Hyper-V you will be able to put on a USB stick if you want to inside your host. And I know ESXi sometimes comes that way if you choose to buy it that way from the OEM, or you can put it on a USB stick yourself. So Hyper-V server is the platform that would enable you to do that from the Microsoft side. Windows Server Hyper-V you'll have to install to a regular hard disk or boot from LUN if you're doing it from the SAN. So it's got that smaller footprint, a reduced attack surface. There's less stuff running 
I can't turn on all of the other roles in Hyper-V server, like uh, I can't make it into a domain controller or a terminal server or anything else like that. It's just Hyper-V and clustering and the core components Hyper-V needs. But the beauty of it, even though it looks a little bit different when you do install it, and we'll take a look shortly just to frame it in, as part of the wider discussion, it does integrate into your current infrastructure. It's still a Windows image, so you can still use regular Windows tools to patch it, manage it, monitor it, control it. And you can use the remote server admin tools to administer it even from a Windows 8 client if you've got one. And it's feature rich. There's loads of things in it, which is great. We wouldn't want to give you a hypervisor that only did a subset of the features that Hyper-V and Windows Server 2012 gives you. So what are some of the use cases, very briefly? Firstly, VDI. Just out of interest, how many people, regardless of vendor, are doing VDI in production today? OK, about a third of the room. That's interesting. So with VDI, you'll know if, you're, if you've licensed it with Windows, which is always a, an exciting and interesting uh, talking point. But if you've licensed VDI with Windows, you're going to be licensing it at the endpoint device, so your thin client or your laptop or desktop. That's how you license Windows in a VDI environment. So the hypervisor you run it on in the data center, it can be whatever it wants to be. It can be vSphere, Zen Server, Hyper-V. And Hyper-V is a great platform for virtualizing Windows client. Firstly, if you run Windows 7 on Hyper-V R2, you don't need to tweak and modify the operating system. No special tools to install inside that guest. It's optimized by default. And we've got some great white papers and showcases of both Quest and Citrix delivering great scalability for virtual desktops running Windows 7 on Hyper-V, particularly with the SP1 release we launched a little while ago. And that will continue through to Windows Server 2012. Yes. Good question. So the question was around, and it's a good question, what would that mean for the end user? And I think ultimately with VDI, when an, in, when an end user is concerned, you're taking away their local experience and you want to give them a local-like experience. And I think to refer to your point, I think the key thing is it's optimized performance-wise so that user isn't experiencing that slowdown, that lag, and they're getting a good experience. That's not to say that Putting it on vSphere or putting it on Zen Server won't give you an equally good experience in the future. But today, we've optimized Windows 7 to run best on Hyper-V and Windows 8 going forward. But it's not just Windows. How many people are running Linux in their environment? OK, a fair few. So that's an important workload that we wanted to make sure runs really, really well on Hyper-V. So we, we actively worked with the Linux community to ensure that our Hyper-V drivers were optimized code-wise and into the kernel to ensure that Linux distributions run great on Hyper-V. And we've made great success. So a number of distributions are now supported by Microsoft. And we've seen a lot of organizations grab different distributions off the internet from the community and run those on Hyper-V. And now, because the drivers are in the kernel, what we're finding is organizations can literally take the distribution, install on Hyper-V, and they've got all of the enlightened drivers and performance they would expect if they were, as if they were running it in a physical world. So Hyper-V Server is a great platform for virtualizing non-Windows operating systems as well. You could say, well, what if I want to run them virtualized on Windows Server Hyper-V? You can do that as well. The performance will be the same. It's just some organizations who are virtualizing free Linux distributions might want to put them on a free hypervisor rather than a paid-for Windows Server Hyper-V. And the final one, and I think this will apply to many of you, a lot of organizations have Windows Server licensing. Okay, they have Windows Server 2008, maybe R2. If they want to reuse those licenses, but they want to take advantage of Hyper-V in terms of the 2012 release, but not upgrade to Windows Server 2012 to get Hyper-V, then Hyper-V Server would allow them to get the new hypervisor and use their old licenses, 2008 and R2, on top of it. So just like you would in a VMware world or a Citrix Zen server. So they're three of the use cases. But I thought I'd give us a quick look. And once we've got through that, we'll then start comparing and contrasting the different platforms. So here we are in my demo. 
This isn't Hyper-V, um, obviously, but we will have a whale of a time. There you go. No, no, don't go there. So this is Hyper-V. Hyper-V server looks brilliant, a beautiful blue screen if there is such a thing. Now this particular distribution of, of Hyper-V, it's thinner, it's smaller, it doesn't have that GUI that you would get through full Windows Server with Hyper-V. So it's that cut down interface. It does give you a few useful command types, if you will. So numerically, if I want to change the Windows Update settings, I'll choose option five, automatic or manual, you know, those kind of things. I'm going to disable that. And they're done. So there is some element of a GUI, but this is pretty much about it. But it's still a Windows image, so I've still been able to deploy it through my usual tools. In this case, I deployed it with Windows deployment services. So I deployed it across the network. And there is other stuff still in it. So things like configuring iSCSI. iSCSI CPL, a useful command. And if I go to volumes and devices, I can still configure things like MPIO here as well, multipathing. So even though it's a cut down, there's still a number of interfaces within it. But the core driver for this release isn't doing everything locally. It's moving away and managing everything remotely. And that's what we've done here. So I'll go over to my another machine that has got a GUI. So this could be another 2012 box, or it could be a Windows 8 client that I'm pointing at my headless servers. And I'm looking here. If I go into Hyper-V Manager, I've got my two hosts here. I've not got any virtual machines on them at this point. And I've also got Failover Cluster Manager. Because what we want to ensure is if we can provide a virtualization platform that's free, that still gives you all of the capabilities like high availability and live migration. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a cluster. Now, anybody who's created a cluster in 2008 R2 and 2012 maybe, it's an easy job. But the first thing you've got to remember, the very first thing that's very important is you've got to validate that cluster. So you've got to validate the configuration to check that everything is working correctly. All of the networks are connected together. All of the disks can be failed over between the different hosts. And that's a very quick process. I'll add that particular server, add that particular server. We'll go next. I actually did it earlier, so I'm not going to do it now. But what it's going to check, if I choose this option, next, it's going to check all of these different things. So the Hyper-V config, inventory, networking, storage. It's going to try and break your cluster now so that when you build on it, you've obviously fixed those problems and you're building on a solid foundation. Because that's important. We don't want to find out three months down the line that a configuration change we could have made prior to building could have saved us having a problem in the future. So it will go through, it will test all of those different things, and then give you a nice report that is your ticket to Microsoft support. If you ring Microsoft support with a problem on a cluster, they'll want to know, can I see your validation report? So that's important to know. And that's different from perhaps what VMware do and also Citrix, where you just generally just build the cluster pretty quickly. So the process might be a little bit quicker on VMware, but on Hyper-V you're getting that reassurance that you've validated and you are building on that solid foundation. So we'll create cluster, very quick. Next, select, select my servers. One, two, OK. Next, give it a name, Mac cluster two. I have to give it an IP address, so I'll choose 10 and 15. I'm just choosing random ones here. 15, next. Checking that's OK, I assume. And once we've got through this step, the next couple, it's just a few clicks. And we've got a highly available, resilient cluster that we can then use to virtualize our key workloads on top of Hyper-V. How many people have got experience in building a cluster in 2008 R2? OK, great. So the process of doing this from a Hyper-V perspective is no different than you would for building a cluster to support a highly available DHCP service or a remote desktop connection broker or whatever it may be. We'll go next, and that's it, done. So it's building that cluster. It's going to sort it all out in DNS and all that kind of stuff. But I'm doing this with the free Hyper-V servers, and that's what's important here. So with something we give away, you can download, but you can still build those resilient infrastructures without sacrificing those features. So I'm going to, I'll leave that. I'll, I'll go back to the slides. I'm sure it will. Uh, I'll tell you when it's finished. Oh, there we go. It's working again. So for the comparison, now we all understand and we're all semi-experts in Hyper-V server. 
we can then go on to comparing. But it's important to note that everything I compare here, it could be Hyper-V server or Windows Server with Hyper-V. There's no real difference from the Hyper-V features perspective. So that's important. So we'll look at scalability. But before we compare with other hypervisors, it's important to understand just where we were before. Because I don't think, actually, today, with the servers and the kind of infrastructures that are shipping for most organizations, the, the scalability that Hyper-V provided in 2008 R2 typically met most organizations' needs. If you think about a host size, 64 logical processors is a significant amount of cores in a physical system. And Hyper-V supports that. That's its limit today. A terabyte of memory. I would love to have a load of servers that had 64 cores and a terabyte of memory, but I'm not unfortunately blessed with those. But they are pretty scalable systems that would allow you to consolidate a number of virtual machines. But I think where Hyper-V today in 2008 R2 kind of started to reach its limit out of all these metrics, I think is the virtual processors per VM. Because whilst a lot of applications will be fine with one or two or four virtual procs in a VM, we're seeing more high-end applications and workloads that need eight or 16 or even more than that. And that's where Hyper-V today in 2008 R2 can't quite deliver that next level. So it's capped at four virtual procs per VM, which is fine for most, but there's some organizations that need to go to that next level. And with VMware, kind of leading the market up to this point, they're obviously delivering a greater number of virtual processes in VMs, as is Citrix Zen Server. So Hyper-V in R2 is kind of in third place there if we look at that particular metric. But going forward in 2012, where a lot of this conference has been focused on, things are just going like, whew, in terms of scale, in terms of improving. So 30, 320 logical procs, I dread to think how much a server would cost that had 320 logical processors. But if anyone can get a good price, you know, let me know. I'd, I'd be keen to, <laughs> keen to understand what it would cost. Memory, four terabytes. Wow. How many VMs could we run on there? Well, with Hyper-V in 2012, you could run 1,000 supported on a host. Now, just to get a, a sense of the room, how many people are running on any virtualization platform 15 servers or more on one host? Okay, keep your hands up, keep your hands up, be proud. 25, 40, 50, you are, 70, you, how many? 107 servers, wow, I have no prizes. Sorry? Oh, right, okay, I couldn't quite hear. Um, that, is, uh, that is impressive, well over 100 virtual machines on a single host. And which, which hypervisor is that? ESX. ES, yeah, Hyper-V. He said Hyper-V. <laughs> um, no, he's on ESX, and that's fine, you know, because technologies within vCenter, vSphere, technologies like memory over commit, which I guess you're, you're using to help improve that density, that's very important. But Hyper-V in 2012 is going to enable you to reach those kind of levels as well. So, yes, we support 1,000 VMs per host. I would like to see it. But it's there, and we've tested it, and we would support you with that. But in other areas, the it's not just scale up that's important. It's also scale out. So 64 nodes in a cluster might not be something on your radar today. You think, you know what? I can run mine on five hosts, or eight, or 10. But the fact that we're going to that scale in the future will enable you to grow your business if you want to in the future. So a lot of improvement. But then we get to comparing with Zen Server and vSphere, both the vSphere hypervisor that you can download at no cost and vSphere Enterprise Plus, which is a paid for per CPU um, SKU that you buy. And also Zen Server 6. So Zen Server 6 is Citrix's latest release of the Zen-based virtualization platform. And you'll see that whilst there are differences between the three, there's not a huge amount in it. And certainly for most organizations, I think any of those platforms would enable you to consolidate the majority of your workloads with confidence. But if you look at Hyper-V, some of its strengths are those massive number of cores supporting the host and large amounts of physical memory. But when we start to get down to the individual VMs, whilst Hyper-V does support 64 virtual procs per VM, which is great, real scale, scale up workloads there inside the virtual machines, What's interesting about vSphere 
is the difference between vSphere Hypervisor and also Standard Edition, Enterprise Edition, and finally, vSphere Enterprise Plus. Because Enterprise Plus is the only edition that will allow you to run the 32 virtual procs. All of the other editions are at eight. With Hyper-V and Hyper-V Server, 64 virtual procs is a default for everybody. So no matter what the SKU, you've got that option there. Okay? With Zen Server, it's at 16, but that's, again, more than enough for most organizations. So it's enabling you to virtualize those key workloads with confidence. All these platforms can virtualize a significant number of machines on a single host. But what's interesting and what you have to consider with Citrix, and reading the documentation is important here, is it depends on what you're running. So when it comes to if you're running Zen Desktop virtual machines or virtual desktops and you're using, for example, provisioning server and IntelliCache, that may reduce the number of VMs per host that you can run. But on others, if you turn that off, you may get more. So it just depends. That's why there's that 50 to 130 metric there. But ultimately, all of these platforms can help you deliver the scale and the performance you're looking for. But there's one important point. If you are downloading the free vSphere hypervisor, you're not going to get any of the high availability. You have to go to vSphere for that. So there's no clustering in the, the download ESXi. You would have to go to vSphere, which that's just how it is. So when we look at some of the improvements that have been made in Hyper-V, and I'm sure you've heard about these in, uh, this week, things like virtual fiber channel. Why is that important? Well, VMware delivered that today. Microsoft now delivering that in 2012. It's not something that's within Zen Server today. But virtual fiber channel is great because it's allowing org organizations to connect their fiber channel SAN, their investments, right through to the virtual machine and unlock new scenarios, not only for performance, but also for guest clustering which we're seeing as more and more important for a lot of organizations who want to enable that next level of resiliency for their workloads that have been virtualized. And up to this point, you've only been able to do that with Hyper-V through iSCSI storage. So people who haven't got that were, were restricted. Advanced format disks, Hyper-V is taking advantage of running on those more higher capacity and more reliable new format disks and massive hard disks. If you're creating VMs with up to 64 procs and a, and a terabyte of memory, generally, you're going to have a fairly decent-sized data backend of that virtual machine. It may just be a very processor-intensive app with no data storage requirements, but generally, those big virtual machines have big data requirements as well. And being able to support that inside a virtual disk, so you still get the flexibility of being able to move a virtual disk around, is useful because the only other alternative is you use a pass-through disk straight from the SAN through to the VM and you lose some of the agility that a VHD can give you. And finally, and we saw this in the keynote, um, ODX. And this is an exciting opportunity for you because if you've got investments in storage technologies, both on VMware with VAAI and on Hyper-V now with ODX, you can offload tasks such as cloning virtual disks or moving virtual machines around or alternatively just moving files, generally copying files when it comes to Hyper-V's example. Offloaded data transfer and VAAI from VMware enable that, that offloading to the SAN where it's faster and more performant. I was going to show, I'll, I'll quickly show how easy it is to create these ginormous VHDX files. So I'm going to go to Hyper-V here. There we are on the screen. New, hard disk, next. So we've got the option now, VHD and VHDX. I was asked at the booth when somebody came over, if I've got VHDs, can I move to VHDX? Can I convert them between the two? Yes, you can, but the VM needs to be offline to be able to do that. Okay, so it's not an in-place online action. So I'll go VHDX. I'm going to use a dynamically expanding virtual disk. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I don't have a 64 terabyte VHD uh, SSD in my laptop. So it would completely fill, well, it, would, it wouldn't even go there. We'd be here till next week trying, trying to get a hard drive to fit it on. So I'm going to go dynamically expanding. I'll give it a name, test01. And I'm going to drop it. I'll drop it there. We'll go next. How big do I want it to be? Well, I'll go, what's the maximum size? There we go, 65536. I always have to type too big so I know what the actual number should be. We'll go next, and we'll go finish. 
and that's done. So I've just created a 64 terabyte virtual disk in seconds, and there it is. But the beauty of this is it's only 20 meg, because I'm using a dynamically expanding disk. So it's effectively thin provisioning. But you'll say, well, what does the OS see? What does the operating system see inside? This is where my spelling and talking comes into play. Got to be careful spelling that. There we go. So if I go to action, attach VHD, test 01, that's the one we just created. There it's easy to 64 terabytes, so I could start using that space. Now, you obviously have to be careful if, you're, if you've not got that space like I have, but it's very quick to create 64 terabyte VHDs, even though it sounds like a massive amount. It's there, it's quick, it's easy. There we go. So when we look at some of these storage enhancements, if we look at Zen Server, as we said, it doesn't deliver that virtual fiber channel today. But with Hyper-V in 2012 and both the vSphere hypervisor and vSphere and Enter Enterprise Plus edition, it gives you that option. But what's interesting about vSphere and guest clustering, as we'll touch on a bit later on, is I can present fiber channel through to virtual machines using vSphere. But in terms of building a guest cluster, I'm restricted to just two guest cluster nodes in that guest cluster. And I'm restricted because I then can't vMotion that VM and I can't use dynamic or memory over commit in that VM. With Microsoft and Hyper-V in 2012, I can pass through using the virtual fiber channel through to the VM and I can still live migrate and I can still use dynamic memory. So I'm not sacrificing agility or density through using virtual fiber channel and I'm getting the great performance that, that fiber channel would give. Multipathing is in the box. And it's interesting with Hyper-V, we provide a framework for multipathing, MPIO, in the box that you can use to configure your multipath from your host to your storage, iSCSI, Fibre Channel, whatever it may be. And our storage partners like NetApp and EMC and Dell and HP and so on deliver what are known as device-specific modules that optimize our framework for that specific array. So you get the best out of your array and the connection. With VMware, they offer that framework in the box, the vSphere array for multipathing. However, if you want to use those optimizations from NetApp or Dell or HP or whoever it may be, you've got to go to those higher end additions. So you don't have that option within the vSphere hypervisor to use those third party additions to optimize. We come to disk size, two terabytes is, is enough for most organizations, but 64 in the future is going to become more and more required. And Hyper-V is really setting out its stall there to say, look, you can run big data in Hyper-V in 2012. And we touched on ODX, offloaded data transfer. So enabling that through vSphere is with VAAI. It's in those higher end editions though. It's not in that standard, not in the essentials, not in the free edition. With Hyper-V, it's in all editions. And the nice thing is, is if your SAN supports it, Hyper-V will just recognize that and start using it. If it doesn't, it won't. So when we look at resources, there's been significant improvements in dynamic memory and the way we manage memory through to virtual machines. And VMware's got a pretty good story around memory management. How many people who were running vSphere earlier on or VMware use memory over commit? Yeah, exactly. Not all of them, it's interesting. So not everybody who put their hands up earlier. What's interesting about memory over commit and dynamic memory is they are allowing organizations to increase their density and get more VMs on the hosts. But VMware will often say, well, we've got four techniques we can use. Ballooning is one, and I guess that's the closest you'll see comparison-wise to Hyper-V's dynamic memory. But others such as transparent page sharing and the compression and the swapping technologies as well. And VMware will say, well, we've got these four techniques, you've just got the one, Therefore, ours is, ours is better. But when you look at TPS, transparent page sharing, this deduplication of memory, on some of these newer systems that you're running vSphere on, with, which have large page tables enabled by default, TPS is becoming less effective at deduplicating the memory. Therefore, you're not having the savings that you do through ballooning. And when it comes to some of the compression and swapping, what's interesting is they really kick in when the host is kind of gone past that point of, I'm running out of memory. So whilst Hyper-V doesn't have all of those different techniques, it focuses on dynamic memory and does it really well, 
it's still enabling organizations to manage memory within the VMs without sacrificing that performance. But both VMware, Zen Server with their advanced memory management, similar to Hyper-V, and vSphere all do a great job of allowing you to increase your density without sacrificing that performance. How many people are delivering what they would class as private cloud in their environment? Okay, only a handful, a few. And one of the key tenets of private cloud, for some people, is that you can charge back. So collect resources and show what business units, application owners are using within the IT environment. And maybe put billing around that. And VMware does a pretty good job in vSphere of collecting that information. And if you have vCenter charge back, then you can bolt that on and effectively then put a billing and a cost model around that. Now, Microsoft doesn't have today a cost modeling application, but watch this space. I'm not announcing anything there. But in terms of 2012, we're doing a lot of investment around how we collect the metrics and expose that so that anyone who wants to build a customized in-house or third-party billing layer, if you will, or chargeback layer, they can do that. So it exposes the metrics for virtual machines, and as they float around, those metrics travel with the VM. So as soon as you live migrate the VM to another location, the metrics don't magically disappear, and everyone gets a free month's usage or whatever it may be. So we're tracking it all over the place. When it comes to QoS, VMware have done some cool stuff in vSphere 5 around network QoS and storage QoS controlling those levels of I.O. that are going to the disks, going to the virtual machines through the network. And in 2012, Microsoft's also delivering some compelling stuff around network QoS to ensure that you're getting great levels of performance for those VMs that have an SLA in place where you say, I need these VMs to always get this guarantee. But at the same time, I need these VMs to stop hogging the network so that minimum and that maximum can be in place and allowing you to more optimally use the bandwidth that you have available. And finally, there's loads of hardware partners here this week, and I'm sure many of you are starting to think about how you can embrace the future of hardware. And a lot of organizations are moving towards this converged infrastructure. And Hyper-V is right there supporting that in 2012. So it's allowing you, if you want to invest in that hardware, that fabric, where you've got those converged network adapters and that converged network allows the integration through DCB. And VMware do a lot of that as well. So VMware and vSphere 5, they offer that resource metering and that collection. If you look at the vSphere hypervisor, however, just on its own, and you're using the vSphere client, it's only going to connect, met, collect metrics from host number one at a time. And if you want to collect them from another, you point it at another host and collect it one at a time. You would need vSphere to aggregate all of that stuff and present it up to, say, Chargeback Manager. With Microsoft and Hyper-V, we're collecting that from all the different locations, and we're presenting that up to something that wants to consume that information. As we talked about memory, all four platforms in this case have more advanced memory management technologies. But when it comes to DCB, I couldn't find anything anywhere on the Citrix support for uh, data center bridging officially. They do support the converged network adapters on um, their Zen server HCL, but I couldn't find anything explicitly talking about DCB. So you may want to have a look around or speak to Citrix. So that's a little bit about scale. But I want to change direction and focus on multi-tenancy. When it comes to security, virtualization sometimes raises more questions. Well, I've got an organization that I want to bring into my service provider location, and I've got another organization. I want to run them on the same fabric, on the same host. How can I ensure that things are absolutely isolated? And we couldn't. Whilst we could deliver that in Hyper-V in 2008 R2 through things like VLANs to isolate that traffic, organizations and customer feedback was, we need more granularity. We need to be able to plug in and build our own tools that interrogate and integrate with your switch in a way that's important for our business. And that's where the extensible switch came from. So the extensible switch unlocks not only that extensibility from partners and end customers and end users and devs, 
but it also unlocks a number of security capabilities. So PV lands is that secondary granular level of isolation, but protection against different attacks from ARP and neighbor discovery spoofing, DHCP guard. It also enables you to filter off traffic to an alternative virtual machine if you want to interrogate and track and monitor that, that traffic that's coming through a certain vSwitch. So it can be very granular around that. And all of it is managed through PowerShell, or through WMI, so standard Windows interfaces. But one of the areas that we also invested in outside of security was performance. Because there's always this perception that there's an overhead with virtualization. It's never going to be 100% as fast as it would in the physical world. And I think, well, it's probably true. I think on any virtualization platform, there's always going to be a slight sacrifice. But what we're doing around network, virtual fiber channel is a good example where we enable that pass through to get that optimal performance. And on network, technologies like SRIOV are going to enable that same level of performance but in the network world. So if you've got physical network cards in your servers that support SRIOV, what effectively happens is when you bind a virtual machine to an SRIOV capable network adapter, these SRIOV NICs, it's the longest acronym in the world, these SRIOV NICs have what's known as a physical function and a virtual function. And their physical function is obviously the NIC. The virtual function is almost like a virtual switch that exists within the physical NIC. So we're going beyond the Hyper-V V switch. We're not creating a Hyper-V virtual switch here. We're hooking the virtual machine straight onto the, the SRIOV NIC. So the performance is significantly increased. But you think, OK, you've hooked this VM onto this NIC. Surely that VM now can't leave that NIC. It's stuck. No. So the VMs can still move around. We can still live migrate them. I can even live migrate a VM from a host that's got SRIOV NICs to a host that hasn't live. We'll manage that whole process. Now, VMware offers something similar in the form of direct path I.O. And direct path I.O. is a capability where you expose the physical NIC. It doesn't have to be a NIC. There can be other devices as well. But we'll use the NIC as an example. Expose that NIC through to a VM and effectively connect the two and get great performance. Higher performance than a regular vSwitch. But the only difference is with vSphere and Hyper-V is that VM is now locked. Unless you're using a certain Cisco UCS uh, configuration. Because if you're not, it is on that host. So you can't live migrate that VM around. It's stuck. So that's an important consideration, again, when you're thinking about performance and agility and resiliency as well. As I said, it's extensible by partners. Cisco, NEC, Five9, uh, Inmon, I think all of them are here at the conference. If you want to know more about what they're doing, it's a completely open switch. So you can do whatever you see fit. You can bolt in a number of different ways. But the final area of security isn't necessarily around network. It's not really around isolation of VMs, but it's around servers located in less physically secure locations. So if you think about a retail store or somewhere that's got an office that somebody could walk in from the street, show their badge they made in their favorite graphics package, like paint, look, I'm from such and such an IT company, I've come to fix your whatever it may be. And in that store, the, the point of sale people perhaps aren't expecting it, they're not, they're not aware, oh yeah, just go and, go and fix the server, yeah, I didn't think anything was wrong, but go and have a look. They go into the back, no, needs replacing, I'm off with the server, and out they go in the van. It's a very extreme situation, I'll admit, but BitLocker, for protecting the data, would help at least alleviate that problem of, well, we've lost the server, but at least the data was secure and encrypted. So physical security is one thing, but encrypting that data on the host is important. And BitLocker is a feature that people often think is just in the client, just in, Hyper, just in Windows Server, Windows 7, or Windows 8, or whatever it may be. But it's in server as well, and has been for a while. So I can encrypt those, those physical local disks that you may be running if you're running Hyper-V on DAS storage. But now in 2012, I can also encrypt clustered disks. So if you are running a small shared storage-based infrastructure in this remote site or this less secure location, we can encrypt that as well. So from a compliancy perspective, if you've got that demand, you can meet it. 
Okay, so that's with BitLocker. And VMware today and, and also Citrix don't offer that inbox capability to be able to encrypt VMFS volumes on VMware or Citrix's equivalents. When we look at some of the capabilities that Hyper-V in 2012 is providing around granularity, it's interesting because Hyper-V and Citrix both offer an open vSwitch now in 2012 and Zen Server 6, which means it can be extended by third parties. But there's not much evidence out there yet of anyone extending that open vSwitch on the Citrix side. But people often think that, well, VMware has an open switch. You know, you can use the Cisco switch, or you can use new IBM have now got one for vSphere, but it's replaceable. Because with the VMware switch, you either use the VMware distributed switch, or you use the Cisco distributed switch, or you use the IBM. There's no other extensibility out there. So it's a closed and replaceable option, which it might not be a problem for you and a lot of organizations. But with Hyper-V, you've got that option and Zen Server to plug in if you see fit. And finally, when we look at, some, we look at the vSphere hypervisor, you'll see on its own, it, it needs vSphere. It needs the distributed switch, or it needs some of the vShield technologies to provide the protection against some of these vicious attacks. But Hyper-V is delivering all of that in the box, and Zen Server some of those bits as well. And when it comes to those performance elements, we talked about Direct Path IO and SRIOV and how they compare. Only Hyper-V has the capability to offload IPsec traffic. Just out of interest, how many people in their environment, and I'm guessing it might not be so many, are using IPsec? Okay, that's a few. Um, IPsec is enabling that protection of that traffic, but it does require some encryption and decryption, some processing. And if you're doing that in virtual machines and you've got a lot of VMs that are going to be doing this processing, that could use valuable host resources. So we can offload that in Hyper-V to the physical NICs that have IPsec task offload capabilities. And VMware has then server, vSphere hypervisor, they don't offer that. But it might not be important to your business, so it's just worth knowing though. And finally, the VMQ side of things, this is effectively balancing traffic and the processing of traffic on the NIC and on CPUs and cores. And with dynamic VMQ, it's almost like VMQ 2.0. It's taking it to the next stage and allowing a more evenly spread distribution and better optimized management of that traffic. And that's something that's Hyper-V is providing in 2012. So third, penultimate section flexible infrastructure. We've talked quite a bit about agility. So some of the stuff that vSphere is delivering, like the direct path, you sacrifice that little bit of flexibility. But in 2012 and Hyper-V and in vSphere, there's a number of ways of providing an agile infrastructure. And Hyper-V in 2012 is really taking live migration up a notch from where it was in 2008 R2. And I've got a bit of a demo very quickly I'll go to my other box, here we go. One of the things that we often found on comparative white papers and the usual blogs and stuff is VMware allow through vSphere on gigabit ethernet the ability to simultaneously live migrate four VMs at a time. On 10 gigabit ethernet, it's eight VMs at a time. So I can live migrate simultaneously those numbers of VMs depending on what network configuration I've got. And Hyper-V was always well, just one at a time and we'll do the migration serially. So we'll do one after another after another rather than in parallel. And that's fine. The performance is, you know, it's nearly comparable, although there is obviously a gap when you finish one migration and start the other. And that lost time meant that it was quicker on vSphere to live migrate VMs off a particular host because of that simultaneous capability. So we worked hard in 2012 to not only optimize live migration in general, and we've seen improvements up to 70% performance, but we've now introduced simultaneous live migration, which if you need to, for example, evacuate a host, say if you're the gentleman there who's got 107 VMs on his, or over 100 VMs on his host, and he wants to be able to get them off that host to perform some maintenance as quickly as possible, then having that simultaneous evacuate, evacuate is gonna be important. And so the ability to do that in Hyper-V is right there. Now, I can choose if I wanted to, wrong mouse, there we go. I can right click and I can do something known as drain roles. Where has it gone here? Uh, here we go. 
uh, where have I put drain rolls, drain rolls, drain rolls, more actions, no, no, no. I could do that, but I cannot remember where it's gone. Port, that's it, it's pause, yes. There we go, drain rolls, what was I thinking? So drain rolls, and what that's going to enable is an evacuation. It's like a maintenance mode. You'll know that from vSphere, you'll know that if you've used VMM and Zen Server. That's the inbox equivalent of maintenance mode. And a roll, if you're thinking, what is a roll? Well, a roll, don't forget, failover clustering isn't just about clustering VMs. It's about clustering other things. DHCP services, remote desktop connection brokers. So draining a role is evacuating the services that are on that, that host. So I could go drain roles, and it would evacuate those VMs onto alternative nodes in the cluster. But I'm just going to select all of them. I'm going to right click. I'm going to move. I'm going to live migrate. Best possible node would choose, well, the best possible node. And I've got three node cluster. There's no VMs on my other nodes, so it would probably distribute them four and four. But I'm just going to go all eight to one particular place. So I'm going to go select node. They're running on node two. We're going to put them on node one. OK. Off we go. And there they go. And I've specified eight. I've only got eight VMs. But if we look here, that network traffic, this is gigabit ethernet. And it is flat out. There is no room for anything else on that network. You know, this live migration network that we've dedicated is flat out. Now, if this was 10 gig of Ethernet, it would happen like that. But in terms of arbitrary numbers to say, well, on gigabit, you can only do four, or 10 gig, you can do eight migrations, you specify what you're comfortable with with Hyper-V in 2012. I just chose eight. So we're migrating eight VMs. I think, are they done? Are they done more or less? Yeah, it's dropped down. Are we there? Are we there? Let me go back. Now yeah, they've gone. And there they are. So they're all running on there now. So that's a live migration, simultaneous, eight VMs. Not, not the most wow factor thing in the world, but it's important, especially when we see those higher levels of density, to be able to evacuate those virtual machines quickly. And that was a key improvement within 2012 live migration. We introduced that storage live migration to move the virtual disks, the VHDX files around, something that o offloaded data transfer can help with. And finally, that ability to move VMs and their storage from here on a standalone host with no shared storage to here on another standalone host with no shared storage is in the box. Shared nothing live migration. But this is very useful, certainly, when we think about how we can move VMs between clusters or in and out of clusters to standalone servers. So it, where you move a VM is completely flexible now in 2012. And then we see network virtualization. We talked about some of the improvements around isolation, about being able to move VMs around. But wouldn't it be great if I had, and I had this discussion on the stand with, with a, a gentleman this, after, this, this afternoon, who said we've got a second data center, but it's a completely different IP addressing scheme and all that kind of stuff. And if I want to move a VM over, I'll have to readdress everything, and all the services might not work. And, Things like network virtualization can enable you to establish that flat network and move workloads more effectively around your infrastructure in a seamless way. So we could move from my site to your site to your site without having to need to readdress that virtual machine. It still thinks it's running 10.10.10.whatever. .10 and for an example, we've got blue and red. Coke and Pepsi, whoever it may be, running in the same fabric. So they're running on a service provider's infrastructure. And you'll see that the VMs, they've got a SQL and a web VM, which who'd have thought, coincidentally, they're running the same IP addresses in their own environments. Okay? But they want to go into a service provider's environment. They want to come on board and matthosting.com, whatever it is. So we'll bring them on board, but we'll not have to have that difficult conversation of, you need to change your IP address, or you need to change your IP address. We'll let them enable the same IP addresses as what's known as the customer address, but in, on the physical layer, at the Hyper-V software layer, we'll maintain a provider address, which effectively is a relationship between provider address, dot 10, which is unique in the physical infrastructure, and 10.1.1.1. And, and the same applies below. So we're maintaining unique physical addresses for them, but where the VMs are completely transparent of this. They have no idea. So we can host both of them on the same host, have them side by side with no conflicts. So that network virtualization is really enabling a very flexible infrastructure. And with VMware, they can do similar kind of things. 
but you're going to need the Cisco Nexus switch, the Nexus 1000V, specifically version 1.5. Okay, because that brings in the, the um, VXLAN capabilities. When we talk about storage migration, VMware has that, Citrix not today. Live migration, the standard live migration in the box across all three, not the free vSphere hypervisor because it doesn't have that clustering capability. But when we talk about that simultaneous migration, you've got freedom with Hyper-V and you're capped at four and eight with vSphere. Not the end of the world but that's just something you should be aware of. Hyper-V is giving you that flexibility. And if you think about how you could team network adapters and aggregate throughput, so if you're teaming 10 gig Ethernet adapters for live migration, your VMs would fly through there. So we're really giving you that. You can just use what scope and bandwidth you have available. But VMware don't have an alternative to shared nothing live migration today. You'd have to move things separately around. But with shared nothing, we can move that VM and its storage very flexibly. All you need is that Ethernet cable. And finally, the final section, resiliency. And you saw we built a cluster very quickly before, so we built that foundation for a resilient infrastructure. It was easy. One thing that we're often seeing now in some of these competitive documents that come out on the web is Microsoft clustering is cumbersome. It requires specialist knowledge. And for an IT pro, Doing something that I did before, a, click of a, a couple of clicks of a wizard, that's not a cumbersome process. That's very, very straightforward. And I think it's a little bit disrespectful for the IT pro to say that's a difficult process that needs those specialist skills. I think IT pros, Microsoft IT pros, can deliver powerful and resilient clusters built on Windows Server 2012 with ease. But what else has improved with clustering and, and resiliency? Backups in the box, even backups to Azure. So online backup if you see fit. But online backup, incremental backups within Windows Server are a host by host by host configuration. It's not a centralized backup solution like you'd get with System Center Data Protection Manager, Symantec, or Veeam, or whoever it may be. So if you've got a backup solution already in place, a centralized one, you can protect your virtual machines with that. But if you're a smaller organization or you are a partner working with small organizations, the incremental backups within Hyper-V might provide a great solution for protecting those key VMs. But here's the big one. And this is really starting to get people thinking about if you're a partner, new opportunities about how I can work with customers and provide them DR as a service, potentially. And if you are a customer yourself, how I can protect my workloads across my sites with the inbox Hyper-V replica. And usually when people come to the stand, it's like, hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. Hyper-V looks great. Tell me about Hyper-V replica and we'll have a discussion. It's very, very popular. People are thinking more and more about DR because the cost is starting to drop. And the complexity is starting to drop. Because with Replica being in the box, easy to configure, it enables that asynchronous, and that's important, it's not synchronous replication. So there's going to be an element of data loss in an unplanned failover. But it's replicating every five minutes the core virtual machines within your environment without any per VM licensing considerations. Now, VMware offer SRM. How many people are using SRM, just out of interest with vSphere? Okay, I, would, I thought it'd be more than that, actually. A few, a few people. An SRM site recovery manager in a vSphere environment allows the orchestration of a failover from site A to site B in the event of a disaster. And then also the fail back. And you can choose to use the inbox vSphere replication that would replicate from host to host. Or you can use your storage vendor replication if you've invested in a NetApp or an EMC or whatever it may be. Dell, HP, Compellent. The beauty of that SRM solution is it's that big red button, bang, fail over. And it run books the whole thing. With Replica in Hyper-V, it's that engine for replication. So I can right click the VM, enable replication to that location, go, and it will start replicating and then keep stuff up to date. But if I had a 1,000 VMs, I'm not going to want to right click every single one of those 1,000 VMs. That would take me a long time. So having that automation around that is important, and that's where you'd utilize something like PowerShell or you'd utilize something like System Center 2012 SP1, which will enable you to more granularly control through things like Orchestrator that failover between sites. 
but the core of that engine is incredibly strong and would enable you as a partner to offer that service to customers and customers to replicate between their data centers. So it's in the box. And it's agnostic. You've, you're going from Dell servers and EMC storage here to HP and NetApp there, fine, doesn't matter. Or you're using Cisco networking here and completely different stuff there, fine. It's completely flexible. So it doesn't rely on some of the same considerations as you would if you were having storage replication, where if I'm a service provider and I've got EMC and you've got NetApp on your site, can you replicate to me? Is that going to work? So the, the Hyper-V replica would get around that. And something that people were, um, shall we say, feeding back on in the previous release of 2008 R2 Hyper-V, come on, do Nick teaming in the box. VMware doing in the box, with Citrix you team in the box. I don't want to use the different tools for the different vendors anymore. I want a simplified solution that you will support Microsoft clearly, and I want it in the box. And Nick teaming in Hyper-V is enabling just that. So it's enabling aggregation of up to 32 NICs, each that could be different vendors. Now, I don't know if there is 32 NIC vendors, but let's just say I could team an Intel with a Broadcom with a HP NIC in the same team. So I've got a lot of flexibility there. To you often get servers that you buy, and they come with onboard Broadcom NICs, for example. It's thinking of a Dell R710 here. It comes with onboard Broadcom, and you've chosen on your checklist on the website, I'll add some Intel NICs. And you think, oh, I won't be able to team those now. Well, with, rep with Nick teaming in Windows Server 2012, you can. And when it comes to clustering, we touched on the cluster scale, 64 nodes, 4,000 VMs, flexible guest clustering. And we talked about this briefly at the start, or near the start. iSCSI now, virtual fiber and SMB storage, if that's where you're going with your storage. We talked about BitLocker for cluster volumes, and we've made enhancements to our cluster shared volumes, our mechanism to drop multiple VMs on individual LUNs of storage, to ensure that it better integrates with our storage partners and antivirus partners as well, because they struggled a little bit in 2008 R2 because we changed from what the norm was. Now we've gone back and we're delivering something that they're more easily able to integrate with. When it comes to clustering, there are three levels to consider. You've got your host. Host fails, VMs restart. Same with VMware HA, Zen Server, similar, Hyper-V. Next level up, your guest freezes up. It stops responding to communication from the host. Restart the VM or restart it on another host. Hyper-V gives you that. vSphere gives you something similar. But the final level is inside the VM, where you're running perhaps SQL Server or Dynamics or Exchange or whatever it may be. And inside that VM now, with, with clustering in 2012, we can look inside, and there's an application awareness we can perform that says, OK, this service is important to you. So you as the administrator say, SQL Server.exe, that's a really important service. So you're doing this from outside of the virtual machine. You're doing this in Cluster Manager. SQL Server.exe, very important service, tick. And if that service fails, the Cluster Manager from outside the VM looking in will restart that service. So if that's a mission critical service, then we're providing that level of resiliency and, and improved availability. Now VMware do deliver something similar, but it's just an API with VMware. So you'll still be looking to embrace perhaps a semantic product that would bolt in and give you that actual restarting capability of that service. So just on its own, it's just the API. So we're delivering that API and capability in the box. And Symantec are delivering, as just one example, the same capability for Hyper-V as well. So you could choose our inbox, or you could choose something that, from a partner that may offer a little bit more granularity. Keeping clusters up to date with patching. If you're using, using vSphere today, you'll no doubt use vSphere Update Manager or vCenter Update Manager. With Hyper-V, you can use Virtual Machine Manager, and now in 2012, you could use the inbox tools as well if you're perhaps a smaller organization. We can prioritize VMs when they fail over. So I need that domain controller to start first, then the SQL server, then the SharePoint bits that I've got virtualized, for example. And we can choose to keep those VMs apart. If you're doing guest clustering, remember guest clustering on vSphere, two nodes, two virtual nodes I can create as a guest cluster. With Hyper-V, 
if it was a Windows Server 2012 guest, I could have a guest cluster of up to 64 nodes, even if I'm running less physical nodes than that. You probably wouldn't, but I could do it. But what becomes important in guest clustering is you don't really, in an ideal situation, want multiple guest cluster nodes on the same physical host. Because if that host goes bang, things will restart, but you've lost both nodes of potentially a guest cluster, whereas you might want to keep them apart using the anti-affinity rules. So that's useful. And that's something that VMware have delivered for a little while as well. So when we compare, vSphere doesn't have that inbox replication like Replica delivers, but it is part of SRM if you choose to embrace that as that additional add-on. But what's important to understand with SRM is that it's a per VM license. So if I'm today, I've got 50 VMs that I want to replicate, it's going to cost me 50 multiplied by whatever the price may be, $195, I think it is, at retail price per VM. But if I go past 75 VMs, the price goes up to $495 per VM. So every VM I want to protect starts to incur an additional cost. So the overall cost of the infrastructure starts to go like that. With Replica, you can do as many VMs as you want, and there's no charge. It's in the box. This is in the free Hyper-V server, remember, as well. With Zen Server, the replication is built, not the replication is built in, the SRM type capability is built in, but the replication you would still need your storage vendor to help deliver. But they would take advantage of that and help you fail over between sides. And when it comes to some of the anti-affinity, the affinity rules and the prioritization, Zen Server does provide that failover prioritization, just like vSphere and Hyper-V, but it's lacking some of that anti-affinity capability in the box. And when it comes to HA, it's in Zen Server, but it's in some of the higher editions. It's not in the free edition. It's so something to consider. And when it comes to clusters, I don't know, I've never met anybody who would say, you know what? we need a 64 node cluster today. But in the future, maybe it will happen. Certainly as service providers start to build out their infrastructure and they see that they want that level of failover across that broad set of hosts. But think about what we said before around shared nothing live migration. Now that I can move VMs in and out of clusters or between clusters and using network virtualization, I can make the network pretty flat and simple the cluster just becomes really a boundary of resiliency, of failover, because I've just got that flexibility to move VMs pretty much wherever I want to move them now with shared nothing live migration on Hyper-V. And some of the things at the bottom there, guest clustering with live migration and dynamic memory. So if I want to move a virtual guest cluster node to another physical location, I can do it with Hyper-V. We'll support that. With vSphere, that's not a supported capability. So you are locking that guest cluster node onto that physical host. And all of that is taken from the, the vSphere Microsoft clustering guide. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, yeah, there's loads of cool stuff with Hyper-V. vSphere does some great stuff. Zen Server's got some cool features as well. But there's some stuff in vSphere that I know Hyper-V doesn't do, or I assume it doesn't do. So both vSphere Enterprise and above, and Zen Server 6 have features that enable me on a cluster to load balance VMs. So spread VMs around, and if one host is getting hammered, move some VMs around. DRS in the vSphere world, and um, workload, dynamic workload balancing, I think is known as in, in Zen Server's world. What about Hyper-V? Well, Hyper-V has got the engine to do it, the live migration that we showed, the simultaneous live migration now, just get that in there. But um, it would need System Center on top to enable that management of that, okay, I understand what's going on on all of my hosts, CPU, memory, disk, all that kind of stuff, and I'm gonna balance stuff around. So System Center Virtual Machine Manager would unlock that capability. So it wouldn't be in Hyper-V on its own. But VMM through dynamic optimization is balancing the load, but through power optimization, it'll enable you to power down those physical servers that are, you can move VMs off onto fewer hosts, perhaps at the weekend or overnight, freeing up some more power in the data center, reducing costs. So as I said, dynamic optimization in Virtual Machine Manager and power optimization in Virtual Machine Manager. Two key features. And to be honest, if you're deploying 2012 Hyper-V at scale, I would hope that you would be deploying it with Virtual Machine Manager side by side to enable you that centralized management rather than doing everything through the MMCs. 
With Enterprise Plus of vSphere, it gives you the ability to deploy from your central management infrastructure to blank physical host using a capability known as auto deploy. So I can deploy an ESXi image to my blank blades or racks or whatever they may be. With Hyper-V, do I have that choice in the box? And in the box, no, it doesn't. You would have to use Windows Server and Windows deployment services and a Pixie-based infrastructure to deploy Hyper-V out to physical servers. But a better way of doing it is to look at something like Virtual Machine Manager. Because Virtual Machine Manager includes the ability to physically deploy Hyper-V based images or Hyper-V server down to physical blank servers. So it would wake it up using the baseboard management controller like an ILO or an IDRAC, wake it up, pixie deploy the image onto the hardware, so it would be an installation, it would be a, it's not a run in memory type situation, deploys it down to the hardware, and from that point forward it would then manage it. Okay, so it's giving you that ability to not only scale up VMs, but in the event of a, I need to grow my infrastructure quickly, I've got some spare hosts there, I can do that. Okay, I'll quickly provision out new images running Hyper-V. And then finally, VMware has a feature known as fault tolerance. And fault tolerance, it's a pretty cool feature. You know, hands up. It's enables me to have a virtual machine, mark it as fault tolerant, and vSphere will create almost, a, a clone is probably the wrong word, but it's almost like a secondary copy of the VM that's kept in lockstep with the first VM. So if host one, which is running VM one, goes bang, host two, VM two, instantly springs into action, and that workload runs there. So it's giving you that slightly higher level of availability to overcome a host failure. And Microsoft doesn't deliver that today. Doesn't doesn't deliver that in the box with Hyper-V or System Center. But where we feel our strengths are in this scenario is really enabling you to build those resilient clustered infrastructures, resilient guest clustered infrastructures, and combine that with the application monitoring to ensure that you're getting a great level of resiliency. But if you do need that complete level of 99.999% uptime, then we partner with partners like Stratus who deliver that kind of fault tolerance in hardware. So they enable you to have that replication between the two Stratus nodes, and if your VM or your host goes bang, it will instantly take over the workload on another node. So it's, that's a hardware-based solution, which means it doesn't, you don't have to sacrifice some of the caveats that you would with vSphere and fault tolerance, like the one virtual process of VM, which I know will be addressed eventually, but today, that one vCPU VM is, is what I can protect. And I can only have a maximum of four on a host. So it's a great feature. And Hyper-V doesn't deliver that today, but we feel that our availability solutions within 2012 give organizations a great level of availability. So, to wrap up. We've talked a lot about scale, around flexibility, around security and about resiliency. And what I want you to be able to take away from this session really is, if you are going back into your business and you want to talk to your teams about, well, just what can we do in the future? What choices do we get? Which directions can we go? Hopefully this deck will, will provide some help. If you're looking for a more white paper driven example, if you do a search for competitive advantages of Hyper-V on your favorite search engine, which I know will be Bing, um, do a search and you should find a white paper that I wrote that kind of explains what we've gone through in the deck as well if you do want to have a little bit of bedtime reading uh, or a plane on the plane ride home if you're flying. So with that, thank you very, very much for listening. If you've got any questions, uh, I guess we've got a few minutes left, so if you do have any questions, you'll have to shout out and I will repeat. But if not, I will thank you very much for your time and enjoy the party.